So, um, I am part of the ACE committee here at church, the Adult Christian Education Committee, and Rebecca Sparks came in with an idea of um, having a presentation of this book, Devoted. It's Devoted Great Men and Their Godly Moms by Tim Chow Ease. Um, now, Rebecca is very busy getting started being a Christian mom, and therefore it came to me to teach this class. Um, the way that Tim um, wrote this book, he focused on 11 different men and their mothers to illustrate different attributes of those 11 godly women. The author writes at the beginning of the book, and this is a quote, Boys thrive under the love and leadership of an attentive father. Boys need their dads to model godliness and masculinity, to display patterns of love and respect within marriage, to teach skills necessary to encourage fathers to embrace these responsibilities, and to be an example to their sons. He continues, that's well and good, but with all attention given to, father, to a father and a son, I fear that too little has been given to a mother and her son, for this relationship too is uniquely precious and important, and sadly we often look upon it with suspicion, as if closeness between a boy and his mother is a warning sign. It may surprise us though to learn our Christian heroes were shaped by the attentiveness and godliness of their mothers." End quote. And then he writes about these 11 mothers and their sons. And I've placed these stories in chronological order. And I, I have, oh, you're going to be so happy. I have, not, I have not covered every one of them. So you don't have to listen to 11 biographies. There won't be quite that many. Eight for, for Ben back there. There are eight. You can count them down. Um, so he went into, he had a different order, he went deeper into their stories, and I'm going to be able to take the time to go. But I want to emphasize the attribute of each mother that he identifies um, as the strongest contribution to the sons. And um, each of us here may identify with these mothers as we consider our own mothers, and even ourselves, and our spouses. Now I don't believe the point of this exercise is to find a formula to raise a giant in the faith, assuming your definition is a well-known and influ influential Christian man, in case you think that's what a giant of the faith is. For the record, I believe that each person who loves and serves the Lord Jesus Christ is a giant of the faith. I interpret this class to be more of a history lesson, to look into the childhood of some of the better known Christians that we know, and then to be able to possibly utilize that into our own lives if something is pointed out that we don't feel that we've, we're doing completely, or that we can, with our own parenting or even our own grandparenting, contribute <clears throat> to children. You should know that I love to read biographies. In fact, I have a funny pattern about biographies. I tend to lose interest in the subject's story after he reaches adulthood. I mean, I can't tell you how many. I just put down after they get to be an adult. I, I, it's like, ah, okay. Um, I'm mostly drawn to the story of a person's childhood, and it speaks to how the person was formed. God's influence is obviously the most important pull on any person's life. What a person believes and what a person does for the Lord are wholly dependent on a plan that we do not form. However, there is an interplay in this plan with the environment of one's life. We don't understand it, and I cannot explain it to you, but what we do as parents matter. God uses our labor, and I'm going to give you some examples that we may choose to follow. So what Tom was saying from the Wall Street, I mean, not from the Wall Street Journal, I'm so used to saying Wall Street Journal, from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette this morning, and those, those percentages, um, it has something to do with parenting. It doesn't have everything to do with parenting. So um, I think we just use the information, and we go forward, and we influence the people that we have influence over. Okay, the first one in chronological order, this is Timothy. And we know Timothy from the New Testament. He was the young protege of Apostle Paul. He traveled, pastored, prayed, worshiped, and suffered 
alongside Paul, who wrote nearly half of the New Testament. The two grew so close that Paul considered him a son and referred to him as my true child in the faith. Paul says that Timothy's mother and grandmother had introduced him to the Bible, and the Bible had done its work in him. The Bible had made Timothy wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It saved his soul and transformed him into the man that he became. And Timothy was a man of the word because he had been raised by women of the word, and his trust in Scripture had become his tr- and his trust in Scripture had become his trust in God. <clears throat> Their love for truth had given him a deep love of truth. Um, now, at the end of each one of the um, chapters, Jim, Tim Chell East, he has a mother's reflection. Um, he went to some of his friends, one of them being Melissa Eggington, and she wrote something about each one of the chapters. And um, a little synops- a synopsis is, um, this is what she said. Where can any mother go who doesn't know where to start? One who is feeling overwhelmed by the thought of spiritually instructing her children? <clears throat> no further than the words of scripture. It shows that It shows us that all we really need to do is to love God's word and to live by it. It's through the word that our children will meet Christ, and it's through the word that they will know him more. Okay, my reflection comes next, which was not in the book, and you will not be able to find it on the printed page. I could end the whole class here. I think um, that example of Eunice and her mother for Timothy is what we hold on to, is presenting the word to our children and living by it. And in doing that, we are presenting them with the world as God would present it to them. One question they do ask at the end of the chapter, though, is, and I wonder about this, is it possible that we complicate the scriptural instruction to our children? where it's really as simple as reading the Bible and trying to live by the Bible. So that's an idea. Um, And I have to say, one of the things I love about this first example is it includes a grandmother. So, you know, Bob Thompson has worked very hard to help grandparents to feel um, essential in the upbringing of their grandchildren. And I think Timothy, right from the get-go, that example is present in Scripture. And that's, that's wonderful. It's wonderful for us. Okay, next one is Augustine. Okay, so you've heard of Augustine probably. He was a Roman. He was born in what is currently Algeria today. He was born in 354. And he was first a professor, but he had a dramatic conversion and became a pastor and theologian. And he's probably the most significant of the church fathers, that means the early fathers, and unarguably the one whose works are most familiar with us. If you've uh, heard of Confessions, um, Confessions is a book that he wrote that is really readable today. Um, So he was born into a respectable Roman family, received a lot of advantages, and his father was a pagan who had a violent temper. His mother, Monica, was was a Christian of godly virtue, and she suffered much in her marriage, and she turned her attention to her three children and committed herself to motherhood. As soon as Augustine could speak, she taught him how to pray. But he caused her grief and was rebellious from a young age. For he gave himself up to hedonism, pursuing carnal pleasure, gleefully bragging of conquests, both real and imagined. Monica responded to her son's rebellion with prayer, earnest, pleading, tear-filled prayer and fasting. And she prayed for him and stayed close to him. And she moved with him when he went about the empire of Rome. And she ended up, they ended up in Italy And he was about 30 at that point, and he was sitting in a garden in Milan, and he heard a child chanting in a different language than English, but I don't know that language, so I will tell you in English, take up and read. 
and he took it up, he, he took it as a command to take up the Bible, and he was forever transformed and was baptized that Easter. Monica was there to witness his, uh, his um, baptism, and she would die just months later. And just to um, be aware, before the death of Monica's husband, he too had become a Christian. Um, the reflection in the book, so the mother's reflection, is Monica's story will comfort mothers who have had a long wandering child, a child wandering from the faith. We've had that. This story teaches <laughs> the value <laughs> of, of never giving up on our children. And as Tom says, um, I can see this personally in our lives, um, to move with them, to stay close to them, to love them, to visit them, and, and feed into them. It's been a joy during this COVID year. Our son, who lives in California, and I don't, you know, we don't see him, of course, all that much, but he really sought us out, and we see him. We see his, um, his, his changing a bit, and I am encouraged. God is giving me um, encouragement about his everlasting life, and that is such a blessing to us. I forgot to mention the attribute here. This, um, that attribute of um, Augustine is patience, that that mom was patient, that she had to wait a long time. And not only for her son, but for her husband as well. Um, now, I'm not letting you say anything. Um, would you like to say anything before I just run through all of these? Yes, Joe. What is the attribute, or did you already cover it for Timothy's mom and grandma? Um, that one was just being a godly mother. Somebody that read scripture and tried to live it to their best ability. The next one is John Newton. Um, that attribute is the hidden strength of a weak mother. Um, this one is a favorite of mine. We know John Newton because um, he wrote Amazing Grace. He was born in London in 1725, and he was the only son of Elizabeth and John. Now, his father, John, was a stern man. He was a sea captain, and he was often not at home. And his mother was a gentle woman, a caring mother, but she had a short life. She, had, um, she was ill. John grew very close to his mother, and she suffered from tuberculosis, which caused her chronic fatigue and confined her to her bed. And it would take her early. But she did not squander her days. She took on the role of being John's teacher, and by the age of four, John could repeat the answers to the questions in the assembly shorter catechism with the proofs. She died when he was seven years old. As you probably know about the story of John Newton, he rebelled against God. He committed um, horrifying atrocities, but later he experienced God's amazing grace and he became a preacher. He became a sea captain as well, and he worked on slave ships. And that that is a piece of um, just horrible things that he did. Um, now, the mother's reflection at the end of the chapter is every bit of the instruction that John received from his mother occurred before he turned seven years old. It's encouraging because this story shows us that even the small things we do as we point children to Christ really matter. There is no way of knowing how the Holy Spirit will work through the words of the Bible as we speak them over our children. And my reflection. Well, I've been in a preschool in the basement of this church. I reflect how many years I've spent. <laughs> how many years I've spent in the basement of this church in my lifetime. Um, so, if I didn't believe what what is made true in the story of John Newton, that what we teach our children when they are young won't hold fast to them. I hold personal comfort in knowing how much my, my son 
<clears throat> who is not following Jesus right now, but he has all this packed away in his heart. He has such a memory, he remembers everything. One time, his, one of his sisters said, you just blasphemed. He said, absolutely not. This is what it means to blaspheme. That is not what I did. And why would he care? I'm not exactly sure. But, you know, he was going to tell him, hey, no, I didn't do that. So I, um, you know, I keep that buried in my heart feeling that um, there is great hope. And I think we fill up these children in our preschool with the love of Christ. We love them. We tell them how much God loves them. Holly's busy, busy, busy down there. She's going to become the, we're going to go further than preschool now. We're going to go into kindergarten now so that we can continue to build them up in the faith of Jesus before they are poured out into, into whatever uh, situation they go to for first grade. But I think we, we have to hold on to the fact of how important it is um, when we teach our little ones about Jesus because it becomes their foundation. And Raven, you're doing a great thing, great thing for Thaddeus. No, thank you. Oh, well, no, you're, you're the one who gets him here. So that's a great thing. He gets me here, actually. He said he cannot miss church today. And he wants to stay. He likes to stay. So he gets upset really. So I thank you guys for that. You have no idea the difference you made. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. Anything anyone else wants to say before we move on? Okay. Uh, the next one is Charles Hodge. And his mother's attribute was her devotion. Now, Charles Hodge, he was born in 1797, and he said about his mother that she was the one person in the world to whom he owed everything. Um, he was one of five children that was born to Hugh and Mary Hodge. His parents met and married in Philadelphia. So this is the first one who's an American, actually. 1790, no, that's not true. Yes, it's true. 1790, right. I've gone over these guys so many times, I'm all mixed up. We'll go back to England, too. Um, Hugh was a member of a wealthy and influential family, and both parents were committed Christians who hailed from a long line of Presbyterians. The tragedy marked their family. The first three children that Hugh and Mary had died of disease. Their fourth child was the first to survive infancy, and then Charles was born two years later. And when Charles was seven months old, his father died of yellow fever, leaving the family with little. It wasn't really explained how it is that a person could be in a wealthy family and now the wife has little. But I know in my own family, that that indeed was the case for my grandfather's family. They lived in Massachusetts, and these folks were in Philadelphia, but in my case, my, um, they were sea, my, my great grandfather, he was a sea captain, and he ran away with the nanny to California. And in those days, you couldn't uh, get child support, and the whole neighborhood did not support my grandmother, who actually had a teacher's college education, but she couldn't get any work because she was a mother. And once she became married and a mother, you couldn't work. And so the only way that she could bring up her children was by doing people's laundry. And my grandfather dropped out of school when he was in third grade, and he told stories about clamming on the beach for their food and how difficult it all was. He was very short, even though he had a 6'2 son, so I have to think malnutrition was part of the reason for that. Um, but my grandfather, he grew up, now I know he's not part of the story, but he grew up to do very well and went to West Point and um, became an, you know, a contributor to society. Um, although I have to tell you, his experience in the church during this time turned him away from Jesus, for, or the church. I'm not sure where he was with Jesus, but he would never, um, 
because they did not support his mother. So the things that we do within our church to support each other, of course, also matter greatly. Um, but I just wanted to say I can kind of understand what happened to this family. Mary was a determined and capable mother who resolved to care for her sons and provide them the, to the best of her ability. And she placed great emphasis on her son's education. She worked very hard. She put them in other people's homes in order that they could be closer to the schools that she had chosen. Um, and she also took the lead in their Christian education by arranging that they would um, meet with her pastor and they would be in a Bible study. Um, so the, the kids, both the boys, went to Princeton College. And she continued to work and take in boarders and do laundry to earn enough to support her family. And Charles Hodge was called by the Lord while at Princeton, and he felt the call to frontier mission. I have to know his mother did not approve of this. The other brother became a doctor, and she, and she wanted him to have that kind, of a, that kind of a job so that he could make lots of money. But he did not choose that. He would become a defender of Reformed theology and a leader in Presbyterianism. That's why he's in this book. But his greatest influence was in the thousands of seminarians he trained into the ministry across the world. For this reason, some have called him the Pope of Presbyterianism. Now, his mother's, um, I'm sorry, Joe, I, devotion. Yeah, I can see it now. Okay, you see it there? Oh, good. Um, now, as time went on, Mary and Charles would stay in close contact, but their relationship cooled. And what actually happened was that she did not approve of some of his, um, his life choices, even though he was working at, at Princeton, he, he was doing the Lord's work. Um, the mother's reflection at the end of this chapter is, this story can serve as a real encouragement to those who are spiritually training their children without a spouse. However, there is also a warning. There is a time when parents must trust God to direct their children and not try to control them. Um, my reflection, in this day and age, there are many people who are raising their children as single parents. And this story gives us an example about how God can bless these more difficult situations. But in that same situation, we have to be careful. Once they're adults, and that's all of us, um, and certainly I, I know that in my own family, once our children are grown up, unless they're really coming to us asking, it's not our place anymore to tell them what to do. If they are adults. It is, it is their choice. And if we're too strong about letting them know what our opinions are, that will, that will bring space in our relationship that we certainly do not want. Um, I don't know how far you would take that out, but that's just what works in my life. Um, so um, I think sometimes we do shield our children. It, I, this came to my mind upstairs during the sermon when um, we were talking, when Nate was talking um, about, we kind of, as to shield our children from um, consequences. We do it sometimes for good intentions. And when they're little, it is our job not to shield them. Um, we're motivated by, law, by love, and, um, but as they get older, it, it can't be our job anymore. We have, we, have, we have taken them as far as we can, and we have to let go. But hopefully, um, we stay in relationship with them. So, okay, next one. I have a comment. Oh, yes. I was reflecting on the single parent and the single mom. Oh. And also, all of us, when we're adults, we have to let go uh, of the aspect of parenting that we had when we were younger. I think an antidote to that is prayer. Oh, that's, yes. That's my comment. I know it's assumed. Yes. I say that. Anyway. Yes. Yes. 
Absolutely. I think because I shortened these, I probably took out some of the references to what the, the mothers were doing, but certainly prayer, heavy prayer, was always involved in each one of these biographies. Maybe I haven't been saying that. I don't know. No, um, no, it's not you. Oh, uh, no, no. I, I was trying to shorten it so I get through all 11. Tom said, you'll never get through 11, so I stopped at 8. So, you know, this should be... It would be good, though, to go back and read it for yourself. It was, it was easy reading, actually. Well, Charles Spurgeon, he was, he was born in 1834. He was born in Essex, England, born of John and Eliza. His father was bivocational. He was an independent pastor who worked as a clerk through the week to, so, to support his ministry on the weekends. And his work and his ministry took him away from home and left Eliza in charge of the children, and she had many children. She gave birth to 17 children, although uh, nine died in the infancy. And this, this kind of reminds me of something I meant to say at the beginning. Just this week, my daughter Erin has been staying with us all week. We've all been sick with the stomach flu, except for Tom. Um, somehow he stayed away from us. <laughs> But um, at, some, at some point during this, um, Tom said, you know, parenting is a real full-time job. It's, it really takes a lot of energy. He said, uh, what do you think? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah, I agree. This is a hard job. It, it, oh, oh, yeah. This is a really hard job. He said, well, did you remember, you know, how, you know, 24-7 this job is? And I said, oh, yeah, I remember. And when they come. when you get sick, okay? When you're sick and you're having to. And when they come home and stay with you, when you're kind of finished with that 24-7 time of your life, then I don't know how Betty Thompson does it when 25 of them in all are at her house. I don't know how that works. But, um you know, just having one in the house, it just reminds you of, you know, all those years when I had three little ones and how do you do it? And so this is kind of looking at parents that not only did all the things, and it was so far our examples are from the past when, you know, they didn't have dishwashers, they didn't have uh, grocery stores to the extent that we have them now, they, they didn't have washing machines. I just think if there was so much work to being a parent, and this, this is on top of that. Um, in our situations now, it's, um, it's maybe easier, but now there is so much noise. The noise that Pastor Nate was talking about this morning, the noise of our society and the so many things to do that we get pulled away from the family unit and pulled away from our job. Um, of bringing up our children to know God. And we have to be very focused on how uh, we parent, I think, more so than the people from the 1800s anyway. Um, this is what Charles said of himself. I rebelled and revolted and struggled against God. When we, he would have me pray, I would not. And when he would have me listen to the sound of his ministry, I would not. And when I heard and a tear rolled down my cheek, I wiped it away and I defied him to melt my soul. But long before I began with Christ, he began with me. Now the attribute of this mother is to be a pleading mother. And Charles's earliest memories were of his mother gathering all the children together to read the Bible to them and plead with them to their face, plead with them to turn to Christ. To her children, she was not only a teacher, but she was an evangelist. And Charles said, how can I ever forget her tearful eye when she warned me to escape from the wrath to come? When he did turn to Christ, he wrote to his mother, and he said this, Your birthday will be doubly memorable, for on the 3rd of May, the boy for whom you have so often prayed, the boy of hopes and fears, your firstborn, will join a visible church of the redeemed on earth and will bind himself doubly to the Lord his God by open profession. If I have any courage, 
if I feel prepared to follow my Savior not only into the water, but should he call me even into the fire, I love you as the preacher to my heart of such courage as my praying, watchful mother. And the mother's reflection on this mother was asking this question. Do we spend as much time pleading for the souls of our babies as we do pleading for their comfort and their ease? Modern mothers need to do more of this pleading for their children, allowing them to hear the passion and conviction in their voice as they pray for their children's souls. Possibly the reason parents do not pray this way is because they have lost the conviction that prayers really matter. But Charles and Eliza's story reminds us that prayers do make a difference, and they're the ultimate way to love our children. Um, my reflection is I can see how I, I have, from overall, probably been too careful in the way that I've prayed for my children too short-sighted sometimes. Um, Tom and I, ha in the past, had prayed that God would just take our son down as low as he had to. And he did, and it was so hard that, <clears throat> frankly, I haven't had the nerve to do it again because it didn't, <clears throat> it didn't get him exactly where he needs to be, although it, it did face him in the right direction. But... It is so hard as a parent to say, hey, God, do whatever you have to do. <clears throat> All I care about is that my child knows you. But that's really hard to do, at least for me. Um, so the most important thing is that relationship that our children have with God. And I've told each one of my children, I, I expect to see you in heaven. <laughs> and this means that you have to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Um, and then I put in, only to be cruel and nasty, because parents, some, mothers sometimes do that, say, well, but if you're not in heaven, I won't even miss you, because there's no crying there. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? I have that said that. It's true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I've actually said that, though, so it's pretty bad. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyone want to tell me how awful I am? No, Are, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not a good idea. The next one is Dwight L. Mooney. His attribute is hardworking mother. Um, he was born in Massachusetts, Northfield. He was the sixth of nine children. His parents were from old Puritan stock, and they came from hardworking families. His father was a stonemason, but developed a love for liquor and was not careful with money. So he didn't follow in the family way. That's, uh, and sadly, the father died, and he left Betsy with nine children. She was pregnant with twins when he died. So two more were born, so nine was the total. Mercy came through family members who helped him out financially for the first year, and through the minister of the Congregational Church, and he brought food and encouraged Betsy to keep her family together. Betsy had to give most of her time to providing for the family, plowing and planting and seeking work from nearby families. And she maintained trust in God's provision and her simple faith was rewarded. Trust in God was her creed. And every morning she read to her children from a book of devotions and on Sunday she took her children to church. Talking about his mother, Dwight said this. Now, there is one thing about my mother. She never turned away any poor from her home. There was a time that we got down to less than a loaf of bread, and someone came along hungry, and she says, Now, children, shall I cut your slices a little thinner and give some to this person? And we all voted for her to do it. That is the way that she taught us. Dwight, Dwight left to work in Chicago at the age of 19, and he worked at a shoe store. I was thinking that's a little bit like uh, uh, um, Mr. Bob Jameson. Bob Jam Jamison. Jamison. Uh, he was in a shoe store when someone left behind a book that changed his life. 
but in this case, he attended a congregational church, but they wouldn't allow him to be a member because he didn't know enough about the faith. But that minister sought him out to tell him about Christ's love, and it was then that he was saved. And he became a traveling revivalist. So if you've ever heard of D.L. Moody, it's because he was a revivalist, traveled across America, across the world, kind of, um, um, his name just left me, the man, uh, like a Billy Graham to our generation. Um, he always was happy to come back to his mother's home, and he cared for her needs as she aged. As she aged, and she died at 91, only three years before he died. Um, the mother's reflection at the end of the chapter is: This story speaks again to single mothers. Her simple faithfulness to church attendance and her fierce love ended up having an enormous effect on Moody and ultimately on Christian faith during his lifetime. Her story challenges mothers to really live as we trust God, to live that kind of faith in front of our kids every day. I didn't add this, um, but one of the sweet parts of this chapter is that when he was on a tour and came to his own hometown, his mother came to the tent revival um, service, and his mother uh, walked forward at the end to accept Christ. He didn't think it was the first time she had accepted Christ, um, but it was, it was something that was very precious to his heart that he saw that um, circle kind of fulfilled in his lifetime with his mother. My reflection is, it's interesting as we read these, these biographies have patterns, and one is that the children come from difficult circumstances, and there's hard work involved. And children had to have less, and they had to do more to support their families. And our experiences living where we live out here are different. Um, and I wonder, I honestly wonder, if, if, it, if, if the difficulties don't actually help children as they are formed, because they have to think outside of what they have. They have to be more giving and, and take less. And I just wonder, although there are some that came from prosperous families, and I think the next one, I'll just do one more, and you will be robbed of John Piper. But um, um, let's do just one more. We'll finish with um, William Borden. Um, this is the man who was mentioned in a sermon by Nate not too long ago, and um, it was on the subject of commitment. He comes from a wealthy family. I'm going to go pretty fast here. He was, <laughs> he was from a, a wealthy family, and he was called into the mission field, and he went to Egypt to study Arabic, and three months later, he got sick um, of cerebral meningitis. His mother was traveling to him uh, to help him. Um, he died four hours before she got there. Um, the quick story is, is that his mother came to faith at the age of 33. They were from a very rich family, but she made it her business and her, and her devotion to teach her children about Jesus and to be strong in the faith. And, and William, through his own response to the gospel, he and his mother would get on their knees every morning, and she would pray that William would expect, experience the power of Christ in his life. Um, it was expected that he would take over from his father. Um, his father died, and he said no. He knew that he was being called into the mission field, and he went to Princeton College um, in order to get his degree. And that day was a very sad day for his mother because she was surrendering. This is, this is her attribute, her ability to surrender her son. And um, she, was, she was thrilled that he had done this, that this was what God was calling him for, but she felt like it was quite possible that she would never see him again. And um, the mother's reflection in, in this uh, biography is, are we willing to pray 
Not my will, but yours be done, Lord, when it comes to our precious young ones. I suppose the real question we have to ask ourselves is this. Have we spent enough time in God's word, in prayer, in really learning who God is and really understanding what God has done? Is there no other way for any mother to pray with any sincerity, Lord, your will be done, yet this is what we are called to do, even and maybe especially when it comes to our babies. Um, I just would like to read to you the last paragraph of the book, and it's in the Mother's Reflection. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves, and we spend a lot of money in Christian bookstores looking for that perfect resource that will help us teach our children. <clears throat> but all that is really needed is a sincere faith and a desire to share that faith with our kids. So if some of the examples in the book have torn us up, convicted us, and made us feel like we are so far from where we ought to be as mothers, better to think on this. Love God, live the faith, believe the word, share all with your kids. Now, the next thing, it seems like a pretty doable formula. I don't know, that sounds hard. It is hard, but it is what we're called to do. And um, the one I skipped, um, John Piper, The Grace of the Ordinary, they called her ordinary, but she was not, she was selfless. And that's what, that's really, um, that really spoke to me, the selflessness of mothers and fathers. I'm not just saying it's moms, but moms are typically the ones that God has put in the position to take charge of bringing up the children, to really make the decisions. Dad might be with them, but mom is the one who's organizing the schedule and figuring it all out. Although I know in the Williams case, sometimes it was Claire that was figuring out the schedule. <laughs> uh, she was amazing. Remember? Oh my goodness. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> Um, so let me finish with um, a prayer, and you need to go to church. <clears throat>